Haida Gwaii's southern coastal region is a collection of ethereal mountains, majestic islands, and rarely seen pristine waterways. Set in one of North America's most remote coastal regions, an incredible legacy of Haida art traditions. I have some pieces in here that my great-grandmother made. One of the world's richest protected ecosystems. The extent of marine conservation is unique. And a Second World War connection to the remote forests of this region. A lot of airplane spruce was harvested from that area. Now, we reveal the coastlines like never before, unlocking the secrets of our maritime past, present, and future. Canada, over the edge. The northern shoreline of British Columbia is a rich palette of coastal inlets, dense forests, and lush islands. The region is shrouded in cloud and mist through much of the year. a remote stretch of beauty on the far reaches of Canada's west coast. But in the distance beyond, tiny irregular peaks line the horizon. It is another chapter in the story of Canada's Pacific coastlines. Haida Gwaii is an archipelago located 100 kilometers offshore. Its northern region is dominated by Graham Island, more than 6,000 square kilometers of stunning beauty. The southern region is an amazing array of scenery. A journey through protected ecosystems unlike any other. On approach to the southern extremity of Graham Island, vast stretches of wilderness are broken up by tiny communities. Roughly 5,000 people call Haida Gwaii home. Nearly half of those are of Haida or First Nations descent. Just north of the community of Skidigat, one geological feature has become an attraction here. Balance Rock has stood for centuries, a boulder perfectly suspended on the shoreline, seemingly defying the forces of nature. The unique rock has been referred to as one of the many natural spiritual forces on Haida Gwaii, guarding these shores. Just south of Balance Rock lies the most populated region of the archipelago. Here, the rich culture of Haida Gwaii, once known as the Queen Charlotte Islands, is promoted for the world to see.
Queen Charlotte Islands was um, a colonial name that exists um, within the province and with Canada. Changing the name to Haida Gwaii was really a symbolic gesture by the province of British Columbia. Here on Haida Gwaii, we've always called our home here Haida Gwaii, and that's how we refer to it locally and with each other. And it was an important milestone, I guess, in our, our efforts to work out reconciliation with uh, British Columbia. Jason Alsop is the administrator of the Haida Heritage Center, a hub for art, culture, and the unique Haida language that is slowly experiencing a resurgence here. Well, right now we're standing at um, Hyolnagai, which is a sea lion town here, the home of the Haida Heritage Center. And we're um, just outside of Skidigate in the Haida Gwaii. As long as there's been um, land and places for us to live, we've been here on Haida Gwaii. So it, our history goes back, um, far back to a time when there was um, just water. And as uh, land became available, our people began to settle here and, and live here on Haida Gwaii. So we've been here for probably over, tw over 20,000 years. The Haida language is a special, special language. We're actually a, an isolate here on Haida Gwaii. So uh, our language is actually um, not related to any of our, and our neighboring tribes. And so right now, our language is in danger of becoming extinct and it's one of the biggest, biggest challenges we're facing as a people right now is saving the Haida language. In front of the center, an incredible display of totem poles commemorates the many Haida villages that once dotted these shorelines. So here we are uh, out in front of the Haida Heritage Center and you'll notice here out front we have six uh, totem poles and these six poles here were all raised uh, in June of 2001. And the six poles were um, commissioned and carved to represent the main six southern Haida winter villages and to represent the different uh, clans and the people who all live in Skidigat today. The poles themselves are all um, what we call house frontal poles. So obviously you can see they're all raised up against the front of the house. The poles tell the story or tell who lives inside. Say you were paddling in and coming to a village, you could come ashore and you would uh, you would have grown up educated in the stories and the origins and the histories of different, different clans and different crests. And you could read the composition of crests and identify which, which clans live inside the house and who, who, um, who they are and whether they're, maybe they're a relative of yours so you'd have a place to visit and a place to stay. It's there to, to document, record, and to pass on our histories, our oral histories. According to Haida tradition, totem poles slowly disintegrate, returning to the earth from which they came. Alsop says it is the responsibility of each generation to carry on the stories embodied in the totem poles. This pole here that is being carved, it's, it's a Guayanas pole, so it's gonna be raised down in Guayanas, uh, the Haida Heritage Site, next summer. And it'll be, you know, one of the very first poles raised, raised there in a very long time. Yeah, 
You know, for us, um, we don't really consider it art. There isn't even really a word for art in the Haida language. To us, it's, it's, it is, it's more of a visual language to us. So without having a written culture, we don't have any, traditionally didn't have any writing. Um, what we call art today in, in, in the form of totem poles and carvings and the paintings and, and also the um, songs and the performing, the visual arts, performance arts, those are all different ways of um, passing on our histories and sharing our histories of the different clans, the different crests and, and the different um, events and, and things that we've survived and been through here on Haida Gwaii. The center also features canoes and artwork, key to promoting Haida culture. The other thing we have here is um, not just artifacts, but contemporary functional items. So here we have a, a Haida canoe here that was carved here in 2007, 2008. Like in other museums, it's not behind glass. Here you could actually come, touch, feel, and learn about the role of the canoe in our culture and its importance um, to our society or to our people. Our role really is to um, basically tell our story, to tell the Haida story, uh, the Southern Haida story, from our perspective, from our point of view, and um, the way that we'd like it to be represented to the world and to share to the world. So we are inviting people here to come directly here to Skidigit, come to Haida Gwaii and to learn from us firsthand. So the way that the, um, the museum is put together and the cultural center was designed was with community input and a lot of community consultation on how, how it should be laid out, how we should be presented as a people so that we're really um, proud and um, we, again, share it from our perspective and our experiences here on Haida Gwaii. I'm very optimistic. I think Haida Gwaii is, is um, full of opportunity. We're in the midst of a transition from resource extraction industries into more um, tourism, um, stewardship and conservation. So we have a lot of say and a lot of influence in what's happening here today and, and what the future of Haida Gwaii is going to look like. And to create a better place for, for our kids and for future generations than, than some of the experiences our parents and grandparents had. So to me, it's very, uh, I feel very lucky to be here at this time. Haida Gwaii is one of North America's most remote and incredible coastal regions. A rich mix of scenery and culture. On the southern extremity of Graham Island, the community of Skittigat is built on the waters of Hecate Strait. It was named after an early 19th century Haida chief and flourished as a fur trading center. In the late 19th century, Skidigat became a refuge for the Haida people as smallpox decimated Haida Gwaii's remote villages. Today, the town is home to just over 700 people. It remains a center for Haida culture and is also home to some of Haida Gwaii's top artists. We're in uh, All About You Arts uh, gallery that I own on uh, Haida Gwaii. Uh, it's located in Skidigat on the southern part of Graham Island. Ben Davidson comes from a long line of artists skilled in the Haida traditions. I have a couple names. The first one that was given to me was uh, Klejung Nung Kingas, 
Um, it was uh, my grandfather's name as well. I also have another name, Sklai Klagas, which was a name that my father gave me a couple years ago, which means ambitious hands. I originally started when I was going to high school. I wanted to be an architect. Started doing the schooling for that and realized I wasn't too keen on doing that much schooling. So uh, between grade 11 and 12, I started an apprenticeship with my father. And after graduating high school, I um, continued on and did a, a four and a half year apprenticeship with my father as well as my uncle and uh, then stayed on for about eight years in total, working with the two of them. Now, Davidson is making a name for himself, revealing Haida art to the world. So there's two main uh, shapes in Northwest Coast art one being the U-shape and one being the ovoid. And it's kind of like our alphabet. When you start understanding how to use those shapes, you, you use them to create pretty much any, any creature or any um, piece of art. I usually explain to people that until you understand the alphabet, you can't become a poet or an author. So it's quite similar in Northwest Coast art. You need to understand how to use those shapes and you combine the two of them with different proportions to create uh, a, a Northwest Coast piece. I do do some pieces that are ceremonially used and then um, I do some pieces that are just for display purposes, sort of, you know, for enjoyment of the eye to be hung on a wall or that sort of thing. Also prominent in Haida art tradition are masks, a symbol known throughout the archipelago. It helps to depict different crests and different stories that go with certain Haida songs. It allows sort of a human to become a creature. It also allows for different shapes and different sizes to be mimicked through the masks. Some masks we have are quite large that we dance, and some are just the same size, sort of, uh, that fit over the face. Davidson believes Haida art has played a key role in a revival of Haida culture that began years ago and will carry into the future. I don't know if I'm a part of the revival. I think that started with my previous generations. I have some pieces in here that my great-grandmother made and I think that's when the real revival uh, was starting. I'm just producing works that I, I get joy out of. I think that's part of my journey is to constantly keep learning new techniques. It has to evolve and has to um, keep moving or else it becomes stagnant. You need to keep in, being innovative in design and, and different mediums and techniques and that sort of thing. So. To the west, the waters of Hecate Strait extend inland.
tiny islands and inlets are everywhere. The landscape surrounding is a mix of low hills and marshes. The larger islands offer shelter from swift currents. Hecate Strait is divided into smaller bodies of water. It is a pristine environment, sheltered from the open sea. On shore, the town of Queen Charlotte is home to more than a thousand people. A mix of Haida and settler cultures. The village was founded with the construction of a sawmill by the North American Timber Holding Company in 1908. Nearly a century after its founding, Queen Charlotte continues to rely on natural resources. But tourism here is slowly growing. Today, the town features restaurants, hotels, shopping, and a marina for boats coming to and from this popular outpost on Haida Gwaii. The village of Queen Charlotte is the largest population center on Haida Gwaii. It is linked to the north by the scenic Trans-Canada Highway. And in nearby Skidigat Landing, a passenger and vehicle ferry connects the communities of Graham Island with Moresby Island to the south. Moresby Island is Southern Haida Gwaii's largest island. It measures roughly 3,400 square kilometers. The landscape is dominated by rolling hills and dense forests. In recent times, Moresby Island may be best known as the epicenter for the second largest earthquake ever recorded in Canada. On October 27, 2012, shifting tectonic plates caused an earthquake with a magnitude of 7.7 .7 on the Richter scale. The 
island is so remote, there were no casualties, but the quake was felt all over Haida Gwaii. On the eastern end of Moresby Island, Sandspit is the main community here. It is home to just over 300 people and features the largest airport on Haida Gwaii. The community was originally a logging center and a base of operations for the production of dogfish oil, once used in machine lubricant and lamp oil. The town is named in recognition of its vast peninsula of sand and gravel, offering amazing coastal views in all directions. South of Sandspit, the landscape begins to rise. The rolling hills of the north are replaced by steeper rock faces. These are the lower peaks of the San Cristobal Mountains. They are marked by alpine tundra, mountain hemlock, and tiny lakes and streams. But even here, far from civilization, signs of human activity are evident. From logging operations to mining in these remote hills. And natural resource extraction is nothing new for Moresby Island. In the 1940s, these hills were the site of massive harvest operations, trees designated for use by Allied forces in the Second World War. For Moresby Island, for the most part, is, is much more mountainous than the Graham Island. Uh, during the Second World War, the early part of the Second World War, um, a lot of airplane spruce was harvested from that area uh, into making the Mosquito fighter bomber. The Sitka spruce are special because of their flexural and compressive strength, and that's why they were harvested to, to uh, build the aircraft. They were generally 22 or 23 rings to the inch, which gave them that extra strength, and of course the lightness of the wood also. Mainly was used for the main spar down the fuselage and the wing spar. The rest of the aircraft was built from, the skin was built from plywood. There were two major wartime logging camps on Haida Gwaii. One was located on Masset Inlet to the north. The other was Arrow Timber on Moresby Island. Today, only remnants of these camps remain. Camps consisted of um, accommodation to accommodate around 200 men, uh, a cookhouse, of course, and uh, all of that went towards the ability to, to harvest the timber.
The Sitka spruce was primarily cut with a team of two fallers. They would use the old-fashioned cross-cut fiddle saws, as they were called in the day, hand saws. And the two fallers would cut these trees, and then uh, the trees would be yarded by a steam yarder uh, to the road, and then from there they would be loaded onto the train flat decks, and then they would be taken down to the, the water, and they'd be put in, into the water, and then they would be made into Davis rafts in which to be towed to, to Vancouver. From there, logs were taken to sawmills and cut into usable sizes for construction of the bombers. There are approximately 7,200 of these uh, Mosquito fighter bombers built. Um, some in England, some in Canada, and some in Australia. Carried 303 cannons, and uh, it became one of the fastest aircraft of the time because of its lightweight and its powerful Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. The Mosquito was used primarily as a bomber. It could carry 1,000 pounds of bombs. And after releasing the bombs, then, of course, they would become a fighter, and hence the word mosquito fighter bomber. Further south, Louise Island is even more remote and largely uninhabited. It is named after Princess Louise, the fourth daughter of Queen Victoria. The eastern end of the island features the ancient Haida village of Skidans. And the awe-inspiring scenery of Skidans Bay. Haida Gwaii's southern region is a mix of awe-inspiring rock faces and endless dense forests. But for decades, this region was exploited. The logging industry harvested large tracts of ancient rainforest here, a practice opposed by many. In 1985, public protests over logging at Lyle Island, then known as Southern Moresby Island, led to a change in forestry practices. It also led to the creation of a unique protected ecosystem. Today, much of Southern Haida Gwaii is part of Guayanas National Park Reserve. National Marine Conservation Area Reserve and Haida Heritage Site. It is often simply known as Guayanas. The establishment of Guayanas, the flashpoint for that establishment was an act of civil disobedience to do with a standoff between the Haida Nation and 
loggers on a logging road on Lyle Island. This precipitated mass arrests, but also an enormous amount of publicity that caused the federal and provincial governments to agree to set aside southern Moresby Island land and sea area to be protected that would become Guayanas. Since that time, quite a bit of money has been spent on restoring Lyle Island, deactivating the roads, opening up the culverts from the logging operations, and now Lyle Island is naturally regreening. Dr. Norm Sloan is a marine biologist at Guayanas. The unique feature about Guayanas is that for um, a temperate, rainforest coastal area, the extent of uh, integration of uh, terrestrial and marine conservation is unique. What we have is conservation from uh, the treeless alpine into the deep ocean. Sloan says the size of Guayanas offers incredible diversity in the landscape. The east side has, is really very uh, archipelagic. It has a large number of small islands, and most of the islands are densely treed. So the area is rainforest, uh, dominated by cedar, red cedar, the Sitka spruce, and, and western hemlock. And Guayanas is home to incredible wildlife. The mammals, there's a quite a quota of introduced species that almost double the number of mammal species that are that are native uh, to the to the islands. We have abundant marine mammal populations. We have abundant fish populations, salmon, a herring, and rockfish and we have abundant seabird populations. Millions of seabirds breed on Haida Gwaii. Many more millions uh, visit the region in season uh, to feed. The ecosystem of Guayanas is considered to be unique in the world. It is known to many as the Galapagos of the North a reference to its geography and its development during the Ice Age. I think the Galapagos of the North in part has to do, it really has to do with the geographic isolation of the Haida Gwaii archipelago. Because Haida Gwaii is at the edge of the North American continent, it's thought that some of the great ice plates that covered the continent did not reach as far as all of Haida Gwaii. So there should have, could have been some Haida Gwaii landscape that was not covered by ice. And this has is, this is created what uh, ecologists call glacial refugia, refuges from glaciation. Because the ice may have not have been covering these areas, um, the plant and animal species living there, particularly the small animals and certainly the plants, may uh, have survived where elsewhere on the continent they may have been their habitat may have been covered by ice. Many visitors say the landscape of Haida Gwaii is unlike anything they've seen in the world. Dr. Norm Sloan says this can be explained by the geological makeup of the archipelago. The landscape is very rugged. It is mostly influenced by a uh, mountain range on the w w west, windward side. And the reason for the ruggedness is that Haida Gwaii itself is on the very edge of the North American plate. So there's a major fault just offshore. There's a buildup of mountainous land immediately on the uh, North American side of this plate. Although the mountains are not particularly tall, they are very steep. Sloan believes the unique ecological and cultural features of Guayanas will continue to make this region an unsurpassed destination.
From my perspective as a marine biologist, it's been a privilege uh, working for Guyanas. It was a fantastic opportunity. Yeah, Guyanas is breaking new ground on a whole number of fronts. That is to do with uh, the federal government working with First Nations, but also different uh, departments within the federal government working together with First Nations towards area conservation. Guyanas is a new way to do business in conservation, and uh, so far things have worked out quite well. Guayana's protected area measures 2,500 square kilometers, more than one quarter the entire landmass of Haida Gwaii. The archipelago is comprised of 1,184 islands and tiny islets. Many of them are found here on the rugged west coast of Guayanas. It's no surprise that Guayanas translates to islands of beauty. Just off remote Sunday Inlet, jagged mountains rise from the sea. This coastline sits at the edge of the continental shelf, with a sudden tectonic rise 3,000 meters below sea level. It is a stark contrast to the rolling hills and rock faces of the east. Incredible wildlife stands guard along the open waters of the Pacific. Heading north, the landscape rises on approach to the western extremity of the San Cristobal Mountains. These mountains face a constant barrage. Western Haida Gwaii has some of the strongest winds in Canada and crashing waves as high as 35 meters. Above water, Mount de la Touche soars 1,123 meters. It is a spectacular summit, the highest point on Haida Gwaii.
Further north, we leave the boundaries of Guayanas behind. This is the western extremity of Graham Island and the waters of Reynolds Sound. Reynolds Sound is the largest sound on Haida Gwaii's west coast, extending 29 kilometers inland, a destination for explorers and adventurers. But navigation here is treacherous with strong currents and shallow water stretching for kilometers. Offshore, Hippa Island holds evidence of just how treacherous navigation can be. This is the wreck of the USS Clarksdale Victory an American transport ship that grounded here en route to Seattle in 1947. The vessel was massive, measuring 138 meters, weighing more than 7,000 tons. Today, rusted, twisted steel is all that's left of this once mighty cargo ship on the spectacular western coast of Haida Gwaii. From the ancient rainforests and rolling hills of Lyle Island, to the centers of culture and trade along Graham Island's southern coast, to the remote ethereal stretches of the Guayanas western extremity. Haida Gwaii's southern region is a rarely seen gem of Canada's western coastline. It is a people's story, preserved and prospering. And a world-class ecosystem that will be the setting for Haida Gwaii's stories yet to be written. Here, on the edge of Canada. <laughs>